Welcome to another episode of Tiffin Box TV. I speak with photography industry leaders who make it a habit of inspiring others, bridging craft and commerce to help you create a sustainable and creative business. Today's guest is most definitely one you should sit up and pay attention to. He is an amazing, amazing photographer, but he's also an amazing podcaster. His name is Andrew Helmich, just a little bit north of Sydney. Australia and so you'll pick up from his accent right off the bat he's not an American but he's an amazing amazing podcaster and I'm so excited to have him here thanks for joining me today Andrew so sure, it's my pleasure look I'm usually on the other side of these intros so that was very cool Indeed, <laughs> isn't it? it it must it must tickle you that you are being interviewed for the first time in many many months probably um, it's, it's, it's bizarre uh, Andrew, you are a photographer. You you run a business called Impact Images in Australia. It's incredibly successful. You're you're a busy studio. Uh, you are a, a podcaster, as I've already mentioned. Uh, you're also an author. You've written a book called How to Book More Portraits. Uh, and this is this is such an important topic for all photographers, especially right now when we're just getting into spring and and summer is following up right away. We need to know how to do this, and you've written a whole book about it. So we're going to talk about that as well. But before we get into all of that, how did you get into photography, my friend? But, look, it's funny. I was uh, I was a mad keen fisherman, and oh, what? a couple of my yeah fisherman yeah <laughs> loved it. And <laughs> I uh, love it too. <laughs> and uh, my friends were, were writing these articles for fishing magazines, and I wanted to be a part of that. I thought this is a way to finance my hobby. And I had to learn to take photos to get these articles published. So I bought a camera, an SLR, a Nikon, and uh, away I went. I was shooting transparency film and had to learn fast and got published pretty quickly, made some covers and realized I enjoyed the, the photography as much as the writing and getting published. And from there, went out with a friend who was a wedding photographer and assisted him, loved that, and then got into it myself. It was, that, it was that simple. Yeah. So you, you, you jumped off of a, a, a fishing boat into a photography uh, career. It's, uh, that's phenomenal. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, well, look, the, the, yeah, the fishing was, um, you know, it was purely a hobby. Oh, okay. It was just something I loved doing. It wasn't professional. Okay, okay. And th this was a way that the photography and the article writing was a way to finance, well, I guess offset some of the costs and uh, justify it to Linda, my wife. <laughs> With all the money that I was spending on fishing. Indeed. No, so were you always uh, interested in communication and writing and things like that before? Uh, or was it, I mean, how, it seems like a interesting sort of jump from one thing to another rather seamlessly and rather effortlessly. And I'm, I'm always curious as to how people pivot so quickly and easily. Yeah, look, I think I've got a, a reputation within my family of um, just finding something that I love and then doing it 100%. And, you know, I enjoyed school and, uh, you know, I, I have these conversations with my kids now. They say, you know, Dad, why are we learning this stuff? We're never going to use it in our life. And, you know, I, I enjoyed school. I, I wasn't fantastic at English. But when I had to write articles about something that I liked, it was, it was simple. And then when I had to, you know, I could see the photos that other guys were taking up. I can do this. And so I started reading books and um, just practicing. And the good thing about transparency film, as you know, it's um, mm -hmm. is it doesn't it doesn't uh, there's no leeway, so you learn quickly. Yeah. So you make yeah, a lot I of mistakes, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of expensive. costly, expensive mistakes. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, what is what has inspired you to not only run a successful business uh, but also start a podcast? Uh, Photo Biz Exposed is, uh, quite frankly, the f may it may quite likely be the first podcast I've listened to uh, intently and for the longest time uh, because it's so well structured, it's so well put together. Um, so kudos to you. But why Thanks. did you decide to dis to to even launch a podcast? Why was it so important for you to do that? Uh, yeah. I love technology. I love listening to podcasts, and I think the fact that I listened to them, you know, opened my eyes to the fact that there there was a, I guess, a gap in the market there. Uh, I was looking for a podcast to to help me with my business. You know, I'd go to seminars and workshops, but it was always expensive. And uh, I thought, look, this is there's something here. I, I can put something together, and uh, you know, produce some content that people will want to hear. I know that I certainly would like to hear it if it was available. 
and uh, you know bring these photographers and their business strategies and marketing strategies and, and other experts you know to people directly you know, into their headphones it's yeah it was just just an idea and it was scary to start um, the, the first few emails that I sent out uh, were scary I approached a couple of friends first and they said yes and then I approached sort of the, the next big name photographer which was Ian Wilkinson in Australia a successful photographer in Brisbane and uh, he was the first big name that said, yeah, yeah, for sure, I'm happy to help. If you've got a vision, then I'll help you, you know, get there if it's going to help. And that was it. You know, once you sort of had that one name and then I was off and running, I thought, okay, if even he believes in me, then, then this, is, this could work. So, what has it done for your business uh, to run a podcast like Photo Biz Exposed? What is it, uh, do, you, do you have a sort of an ROI on that or is it sort of a completely separate entity in itself? It's completely separate. It hasn't. It hasn't. Look, you know, the only way it's really affected my business is I get to use and experiment and try the things that I'm hearing from the guests. Uh, so you know, I, you know, Pat Flynn says it in his podcast that he's a crash test dummy for internet marketers, and I feel the same way in my business. You now I'm trying different things that I'm hearing and implementing and reporting back on the podcast. Uh, it's difficult to try everything, um, you know, which listeners can attest to. But I'll pick out things that I think can help my business and implement them and um, yeah look so far so good I think the listener likes hearing that aspect whether it's worked or hasn't worked and it's it, some things have worked great in my business I, you know it hasn't changed everything overnight uh, I don't think anything can do that so it, it really is a separate entity and if you ask my wife she says I spend way too much time on the podcast and uh, you know I, I have run it as a separate I guess business from the start having the premium membership it's uh I said, if I'm going to do this, it has to pay some some of its own expenses, uh, you know, to justify the amount of time that goes into it. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. That's that's just smart thinking uh, from a from a very business perspective of of just having something to do. Uh, even different boxes like that, you know, it, it's run with affiliate links and things like that. Uh, going back a little bit though, give me a, a an example of. Uh, something that you've learned from a guest that you've implemented and it's been a success. What? What can you can you think of something that? that For sure. Yeah. Look, um, one that springs straight to mind is uh, Gabriel Mortuary. He's a, an SEO expert, and he's you know we I've interviewed other SEO guys and they get right into the the technical aspects. You know, uh, you know meta tags and and keywords and um, long tail keywords and writing blog posts and but they they go more technical. Gabriel's approach was different. He said, think about what your client wants to read, what they would be looking for, and write for them. You know, and he said that you, you could go into a, a group and ask, you know, women that are looking at getting married where where they're looking at getting married and why those places and you know what what their uh some of the issues they're worried about, say beach wedding for example. And then I went and recorded some videos and answered the questions that they had about having a beach wedding, you know, whether it was going to be too windy, how to cope with the sand, what's a, a wet weather backup plan. And it, it was simple. You know, he, he didn't make it more difficult than it had to be. It was a simple matter of recording videos with an iPhone and having them transcribed, writing a bit of blog post with it. And now I rank, you know, top, first page in Google for those search terms in my local area. Really simple. And it, it, it's... it's uh rather convenient that you live a few feet away from the beach right <laughs> yeah but look you know this would work for, for anywhere <laughs> well uh, it, it makes it more applicable to your own business because of what you uh, because of the content you put out. i mean someone who living who's living in the middle of australia for instance uh talking about a beach wedding makes no sense at all right no of course of course that's right so but you know look on the other hand if i uh, you know if you're talking to someone that lives in the states and they might be uh you know in the middle of the states nowhere near a beach but you know the, the couples might want to get married by a lake or on a mountain so you go there or to a certain venue go there and record a video and talk about that venue the lo the places you would use for photos and um build a relationship as well with the with the people who run the venue and you know you've got a blog post you've got a series of blog posts with great keywords naturally that people will be searching for and well, uh, yeah uh, you've just heard one quick tip from andrew helmich i mean this is <laughs> phenomenal and this is the kind of stuff that you will hear all the time on his podcast seriously uh when i work out i listen to your podcast because it's like i'm a it's a it's a twofer 
like I'm getting my exercise and also my brain's getting like all kinds of great information. So I love it. Um, I'll have links to your podcast, of course, in the po- in, in the blog post that I, I'm going to uh, publish. But I wanted to talk about your book next, if you don't mind, um, how to book more portraits. Why did you decide to <laughs> launch this book? Why was it so important for you? I mean, you are a, a, a photographer that you've already established yourself. You don't need to know how to book more portraits. You know how to do that already. But why write the book for other photographers? Oh, well, look, I guess the first thing, is it, it's, it was a good way to show that um, – you know, it's not that difficult to to get portrait bookings. You know, and it's a, it's a great area to build up, particularly for wedding photographers. You know, we haven't we haven't got weddings all year round. Um, same for you guys. You know, you have that winter period. There's less weddings for us in Australia. Certainly for me in my area, the winter time is a perfect time to be targeting more portraits. It's a good way to to build up the business and uh, create more work. So you know, it was a, it was a way to show photographers that it's possible. To get portraits, to get portraits simply, and to, to get a lot of them, to book a lot of them if you want to. Um, and look, and I guess you know, full transparency here it was another way for me to let people know about the podcast because if they download the book, you know that they've, they've got to give me their email address. I know it's a big trade-off. Uh, I can guarantee them lots and lots of bookings as a result. But it was a way for me then to introduce the the, the podcast at the same time. Okay, awesome. Tell us a little bit about the voucher system which you discuss in the book, uh, briefly if you don't mind. Uh, give us an idea as to what kinds of things that people can learn from the book uh, that they're going to take away and implement right away. I mean, that's what I love about your podcast is that the, your guests come up with these amazing things that you, they will just talk about uh, you know, their business and how they did things and uh, and then you implement it and you, you come back and you say, yep, this is, this is exactly what they said and this is exactly how it worked <laughs> out. Uh, I love that. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain level of corroboration that makes your podcast legitimate in a way. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, in a sense, when, when you listen to your podcast, you, it's not fluff. It's real, no. useful, yeah. implementable information that, that people can actually you know, succeed in, you know what I mean? Like their businesses will boom if they were to just implement the stuff that you're talking about. So the book is a sort of, in, in a way, it's, it's one of those things that if you read all the way through, you're going to learn how to just book more and more portrait sessions if that's what you want to do. Talk about the voucher system though. Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of different styles of voucher systems. This one is uh, one that I've used and super successfully. Basically, you will go and look for a business that is servicing your target client. So if you're a baby photographer, uh, you know, you'll get all baby store. If you're a, a kid's photographer, you're going to find someone that's targeting that same dem- demographic, the kids. So let's say the baby store, for example, uh, you want to shoot more or photograph more babies, then you, you create a, or you go in and introduce yourself to this shop that's got this great uh, business with your target clients. And the voucher system is a way for them to, I guess, to to give a, a bonus to their customers. So in my situation, what I did, I created vouchers for $250. The, the, the shop owner would give a voucher for a free photography session and an 8x10 to any customer that spent over $200 in store. And you can set that price to whatever you want to have it at. Now, the beauty of this particular voucher system is they would have a the voucher with a little stub. The client or the, the customer would enter their details and they'd tear off the voucher. And, and this is where the real secret is with this particular system is you have the customer's contact details and they've given them freely and they've, they've basically entered into the, the, the idea of having a, a portrait taken with you. So uh, once a week we would collect these vouchers and make the phone calls and, and book in these portrait shoots. And... Um, you know, there, there's little tricks to, to get a lot more vouchers. So when we first started, we were getting sort of one, two, three, four, five vouchers a week. Uh, once we started you know, getting things worked out, it was 20 to 30 voucher stubs per week. And, you know, you don't convert 20 to 30, but if you convert 10 to 15 per week, that's a lot of portraits. And, uh, and that's the way it was. It was fantastic. Now, sorry, just before you say, <laughs> I was just going to say that the, the big thing with this is, look, you are giving away a free shoot and an 8 by 10 or, a, or, a, or a, uh, you could also give uh, a voucher to the value of an 8x10, a credit. So you have to have be a good enough photographer to be able to produce 
saleable work yes. for every shoot. Otherwise, you will go backwards. Uh, and the other big thing is you really have to concentrate on averages because some clients will just take their free print or you know, and that's all they're going to take. Uh, you are relying on them falling in love with the photos and wanting to purchase more. And, uh, you know, and it's important not to hide that fact that they're going to want to buy more you know, when you talk to them, when you set up this, this shoot. Um, that the worst thing I ever want to do living in a small community is to feel like I'm tricking someone into buying more photos. Um, you know, I'm not tearing up 8 by 10 prints in front of them because they didn't buy them. Uh, it, it's all very relaxed. It's not a high-pressure sales system. And there are photographers in Australia that have done that. I was going to ask so, you, uh, really? People do that? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, look, yeah, look. I, I thought it was an urban myth, but this is a true story. There was oh a photographer goodness. in Melbourne. Uh, he would have his proofs printed up as 8 by 10s and uh, bring, the, bring the family in to look at the photos and they'd have a, a pile of 8 by 10s and the mother would say, yes, I like that one. Yes, I like that one. He'd put those aside. Oh, I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> Bin. And then <laughs> there'd be tears. <laughs> goodness. So, of course, he got great sales because no one wants to see a photo of their child ripped up. And uh, so, yeah, but look, that's, that's not, I don't advocate that style yeah, that no. approach at all. Uh, I don't want, I mean, I see my clients. Not my style you know, local, either. <laughs> no. You know, I, I see my clients, you know, at the local soccer games, you know, with my kids at the shopping center. I don't want to have to bow my head down and, uh, and walk through and hope they don't see me. I want to be able to say hi and, you know, are you still enjoying your photos? So. Excellent. Excellent. Very cool. There, this is sort of in a nutshell what this book is all going to be all about. Uh, it's a free download. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Yes. So, I mean, you're getting a full blown book uh, with all these, all this great information for free, folks. So, I'll have a link to that as well. Let's move on to uh, perhaps talking about the future, if you don't mind, uh, because the future is exciting. Uh, there's lots of wonderful things coming up t in terms of technology, in terms of uh, just content, in terms of being able to photograph people in a certain way or whatever it is. What are you most excited about uh, in the for the photography industry? Wow, that's that's a big question. You know what? I, I, the interview that I just did last week uh, was with, with Ian Weldon, and he, he has a philosophy that I that I admire, and I don't see very often. And that's the way that he shoots, or the way he approaches his photography. Is he, he has this ability to lock out what anyone else thinks, and his photography isn't everyone's cup of tea. It's it's grainy, it's contrasty, it's direct flash, it's not flattering, uh, but it's interesting, you know, and it's gritty and raw. And but, but the best part about it is he doesn't care what anyone else thinks. So if someone else rubbishes his work, he doesn't care. I, I think we're going to see more of that. I think we're going to, at the moment, I think everyone is doing the same, or a lot of people are doing the same thing. We're seeing so much on the internet. We're, we're copying what we see, what, what we see other people like. I think there's going to be a shift away from that and people are going to start searching, I guess, within themselves and putting out the kind of work they want and attracting the clients that, that are drawn to their work. And, and I can't wait for that to happen. And uh, I'm looking forward to it happening with my own work. You know, I'm excited about it too. I, I, I don't know if that's the sort of answer you're looking for. No, no, I, lo I love it. I, I, no, I love the answer uh, only because uh, I've been thinking along those same lines as well, interestingly, because, uh, you know, I've long felt, and I, this is probably very controversial for me to even say it, but I feel if I, when I, I, I've stopped looking at wedding photographers' blogs because the work seems rather li like as if one's copying the other person in a way, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the sense of emotion, the sense of feeling of for one another is simply not there. It's more about the details, it's more about the, the, "Quote unquote epic shots, uh, you know, of big skies and little people, and it, 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 for me, once in a while you can do that, but not every single wedding, you know. Uh, and I, it seems to take away from the idea that so it's, it's a you're trying to to photograph and tell the story of two people coming together, two families coming together. In my case, if you're photographing Indian weddings, it's all about the families." Uh, and when you start minimizing people in, in the in your frame where you're not they're not even recognizable and you think that's a great photograph well sorry that's not in my book it's simply not you know it it just it's a it's one of many perhaps but if you start making those same photographs again and again and again uh well people are going to get tired i'm getting very tired of what i'm seeing so far 
which is where I feel I think this idea of returning to what you really want to produce and what you're really feeling and then producing that is so amazing. Um, you know, you, 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 I'm sure you've talked to Jesh the Rocks or um, well, there are other people here in, 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 in America who are photographing families, for instance, you know, in such an amazing, intimate way that it, every single frame is just really unique. You know, you're not mm -hmm. seeing the same emotion again and again and again played out. And you're like, you're, it's fresh in a way, you know, and it's yeah. real. And, and you feel like, oh, I know that family or I know that couple, you know. Um, so that's where I think things are going. And so it's interesting that you mention that this is how this one photographer is approaching mm. his photography, you know. So uh, I applaud him for, for, for doing that. I appreciate that. Um, last question for you, sir. And, and hope it's not a doozy. Uh, what challenges <laughs> you as a photographer and a podcaster? Time, time limitations. Okay. You know, the, the, the podcast takes up a lot of time you know, and, I, and I can't take too much away from the photography business as much as I want to see the, the podcast grow and succeed. I, I've, got, I've got school fees, I've got a mortgage, uh, you know, I've got expenses like everyone else. So, you know, the podcast has to pull its weight, otherwise uh, it wouldn't exist. And, you know, and then it's juggling that with the marketing and the blog posting and then the shoots, you know, and, and family time. So I get that's the biggest challenge for sure. And, you know, and I want time for myself too. You know, you're at the gym. I'll, I've been cycling this afternoon or tonight. Uh, you know, I want time to do that too, not, not just work. Indeed, indeed. Well, that's great. Uh, great advice for all of us who are juggling uh, a very, very busy schedule. I know uh, my kids are upstairs right now, very quiet, because I said, I'm recording a podcast. Do not run around with the with bounce, bouncing the basketball, because <laughs> that's what they would be doing right now. Otherwise, so. Uh, but thank you so much for joining me today, Andrew. It's, it's such a pleasure to, to connect with you. And uh, really, I'm a huge fan of your show. I mean, ridiculous fan, really. Uh, I, I, I hope other photographers uh, catch on to the idea that you are dispensing amazing information uh, through your podcast. I mean, it's really solid, solid stuff. So, um, I, and I hope I can achieve a, that level of success in my podcast as well. I mean, in some ways I'm learning from you. So I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, it's flattering and, it, and it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Sashu. Take care, buddy. Bye. Bye. Bye.